Welcome, I am your host, and this is the Unanswered Questions Podcast. Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of my new podcast, Unanswered Questions, where every week we will endeavour to discuss a mysterious unsolved case that has many lingering unanswered questions. So I hope you enjoy, and as always, leave me some feedback on what you think about the show, and rate it as well. Now on to the show. This week we'll be talking about the Dayton Strangler. So, the Dayton Strangler was an unidentified early 20th century serial killer responsible for the murders of five women and one man in Dayton, Ohio from 1900 to 1909. Although a multitude of suspects were arrested, including one who was wrongly convicted, the murders remain officially unsolved to this day. Now we're going to get into the murders. So first we have Ada Lance. So the daughter of a prominent local carpenter, the 11-year-old Lance was found in a vault in her parents' backyard on October 14th of 1900. The night before, there was a party in the residence, and while the adults were playing cards, Ada had left the house unnoticed. Half an hour later, her body was discovered. She had been badly mutilated and bruised with a scar from a blunt weapon that was never identified across her face and had been sexually assaulted. Several people were arrested, most notably a man named Emmons, who had been seen standing on the sidewalk near the Lance residence by two women, following a year later with the arrest of 18-year-old Harrison Blessing in a Germantown saloon. The authorities received a tip by William Hanna, owner of a bicycle shop from which Blessing had stolen a wheel. Although the young Harrison allegedly confessed to the murder, he was later released for lack of evidence. Then we come to the second murder victim, which was Donna Gilman. So, on the 20th of November 1906, the 20-year-old Bindery Department employee of the National Cash Register Works left her job and headed home. Usually accompanied by her sister Fane, Donna Gilman boarded a train car with a group of friends, staying with them before her transfer at Arlington Heights. Then, she got on another train car, reaching a short distance from her home, before suddenly vanishing? The situation was unusual, as the night before she had just written a note to her lover Stanley Anderson, of Sharon expressing her desire to see him on that Sunday evening. On the night of the disappearance, a neighbour of the Gilmans, Robert Keyes, heard something that sounded like a struggle in their home. Soon after, Donna's body was found in some weeds, 200 yards away from home and on the opposite side of the street. Her gloves and umbrella were found as well. The authorities quickly realised that she had not died on the spot as a crime scene was visible from many homes and that it was very likely she had been murdered in a nearby house and then her body was then dumped there. Police barred off the area from onlookers in search for clues, with one Cincinnati sleuth, William S. Heitzman, allegedly finding a book which Gilman was reading on her ride home. Despite multiple suspect arrests and even a confession, nobody was convicted of her murder. Then we come to the murders of Anna Markowitz and Abe Cohen. So, on the August 4th of 1907, the 24-year-old pawnbroker's daughter from Covington, Kentucky, and her travelling salesman boyfriend from Indianapolis were walking along a lonely road near the National Soldier's home, accompanied by Anna's younger sister, Bertha. As they reached a completely isolated spot in McCabe Park and started chatting with each other, suddenly a man crept up behind Cohen and struck him with a baton. Surprised, Abe turned around, only to be shot twice in the stomach. The attacker then turned towards the sisters, but the frightened Bertha ran off panic to call the sheriff. A posse was quickly formed and they rushed back to the crime scene where they found Cohen lying half dead on the ground. There was also a trail leading to some bushes where Anna's body was found. There was evidence of a brutal struggle and subsequent rape, with Markowitz's clothes clearly torn from her body and her arms covering her eyes. She had been strangled to death. In the meantime, Cohen was rushed to the hospital where, although he was still alive, he was so dazed that any of his statements were considered incoherent. Two days later, he sadly succumbed to his injuries. The only clue left to the mystery was provided by Eliza Virus, a black housekeeper who was close to the crime scene. She claimed that at around 10 o'clock on Sunday night, she'd heard gunshots and a wound crying in reproach. Soon after, the voice said, Harry! Harry! Oh, Harry! End quote. The mysterious Harry was never identified, and the man who was convicted of the double murder, Leighton Hines, was later proven to be innocent. We'll come back to Leighton Hines. Then we come to the murder victim, Mary Forshner. So, on January 24th of 1909, the 15-year-old employee of the Kling Tobacco Warehouse, described as unusually pretty for her age, left the home of her merchant stepfather, Robert Gippert, in North Dayton. She was carrying a Dayton Savings and Trust Company's deposit book with $9 in it for placing it in the bank. Her movements after the house remained mysterious, but after she failed to return, her parents became alarmed. Geppert got himself a lantern and organised a search party with neighbours Arthur Heyer and John Merkel, without notifying authorities till midnight. 
Lieutenant Haley dispatched officers to aid in the search, but before they arrived, Robert Gippert noticed some disturbed soil which led to a trail. It ended in the estate of Grafton C. Kennedy, where with the aid of his lantern, Gippert found Mary's lifeless body. The coroner concluded that she had been sexually assaulted and then strangled to death. Two people claimed to have seen the assailant, Sam Morris and a Mrs. John Sheff. Morris said that she had heard cries at about 6.30pm and looked outside, observing a man sitting on a fence and glancing at a dark spot in the fields. He tried to approach the mysterious stranger who threatened to shoot him, going back to retrieve his shotgun and fire off a warning shot into the air, but by the time he returned, the man had vanished. Mrs. Sheff, on the other hand, claimed that she'd just gotten off a train near the same spot when a man appeared out of the darkness. She began running towards her home with him following suit, but the man ceased after she entered her home. In the meantime, another woman, Mrs. Powers, was attacked, but thankfully saved by her husband, James. The perpetrator escaped, but left his victim with nearly all clothes torn and her throat bruised. The coroner, upon performing the autopsy, established that the killer had abnormally large hands and his finger imprints extended far around the victim's neck. Four days later, a Pennsylvania railroad detective reported that a man matching the description was observed getting off a Dayton train car at Springfield. The suspect was a black man with a roughly bandaged hand, scratched face, and wore cordry trousers, the same type of clothing that the supposed killer had worn. The suspicious man was never located. Then we come to the the victim, Elizabeth Fullhart. So, on February 7th of 1909, the 18-year-old Fullhart from Vandalia arrived in Dayton in search of employment. The day after, she mysteriously vanished. A week after she disappeared, two workmen decided to open an old cistern, only to find her body wrapped in a gunny sack floating in the water. She was fished out from the manhole and identified via her brother. What was peculiar about this killing is the fact that Fullhart appeared fully clothed, but was lacking her undergarments, suggesting that her killer had redressed her before dumping the body in the cistern. Initially, authorities experienced difficulty in determining the cause of death due to the notable lack of choking fractures on the neck, unlike the previous victims. Several theories were advanced, including suicide poisoning or that the bag was tied around her head and she was thrown in while still alive. The murder shocked the Denzians of Dayton and the church attendance among women dropped significantly. At night, almost no female was left unescorted. Following Fullhart's death, the killings ceased. Now we come into the suspects in the case. First off, we have David Curtis. So, he was known by the moniker of Baby Dave. David was a 27-year-old adopted son of James Curtis, a painter who lived near the National Soldiers' Home. Described by associates as a half-wit, he did not live with his father, only going there once a week. According to James, ever since he was young, David had the habit of telling fanciful tales which he ascribed as his doing. As he was an employee of the National Cash Register, he knew about Donna Gilman. The newsboy was arrested following a tip from the, from a Cincinnati Post journalist known only by the name of Myers, and then immediately confessed to the crime. According to his story, Curtis had noticed Gilman deciding to board on the same train and get off at her stop. Walking on the opposite sidewalk and following Donna, he eventually crossed over, grabbed her umbrella, and strangled her with it without uttering a cry. After killing her, he knelt down and cried over his deed, vowing never to do it again. Despite the length of his confession, it was harshly doubted by many as he had falsely confessed to another murder some two years before and was subsequently exonerated. Despite the circumstances, Coroner Walter L. Klein made a statement to the papers that he was completely assured that Davis Curtis is Gilman's killer, describing him as a not very bright but definitely not crazy and surprisingly cunning individual. On the very same day that statement was written, Curtis suddenly revealed that he was threatened into confessing by County Detective Frank McBride, who had threatened him with a death penalty. He explained that on the date of the murder, he had been distributing newspapers for long after the crime was supposedly committed and only heard of it from friends. Curtis, having a habit to play detective, then went on to conduct his own investigation of the murder scene. Although several people testified against him, including his employer and Donna's brother Collins, the defense team was well prepared, and the day after the testimony, it was announced that David Curtis was cleared of the Gilman murder. His dismissal was well received by the citizens of Dayton, who greeted and cheered for him upon release. A week after New Year's Eve, however, Coroner Klein urged further investigation against Curtis to no avail. Next, we have the Gilman family. So, on December 10th of 1906, the day that Donna Gilman's body was exhumed, an arrest warrant was put out against her mother, Kate. However, due to her ailing health, she was kept under watch, while two of her other children, Collins and Fane, were arrested as accessories in their sister's murder. The siblings pleaded not guilty at the trial, with the 18-year-old Collins testifying against David Curtis, who he alleged had confessed to him as well. Upon hearing that there were arrest warrants for her children, Kate Gilman tried to commit 
suicide by jumping out a second story window at the Miami Valley Hospital, but was restrained by the attending nurses. She was ordered to be examined by two reputable physicians, Drs. H.J. Guy and A.H. Idings, and although she resisted, they declared that she was healthy enough to be transported to jail. At trial, a female co-worker and friend of Donna revealed that the victim had been abused by her mother, for example, one time Donna was locked in a closet simply for wanting a new dress. On the night of the murder, the friend explained that the would-be victim was particularly afraid to go home. On December 22nd of 1906, the Gilman family members were released from jail on a $5,000 bond. Collins was the first to be released, greeted by a crowd of friends, while his mother was put in an ambulance and driven off to St. Elizabeth Hospital. In April of 1907, the family appeared in court again, this time including another daughter, Bessie, who lived in Germantown. All of them were released on bond again. After a few days later, the mother and son for $2,500 and the two daughters for $1,000 each. Soon after, the family was cleared of the murder. On December 21st of that year, Kate Gilman passed away from edema and three days later, her body was buried beside that of her murdered daughter. Then we come to the next suspect, which was Leighton Hines, as I mentioned before. On October 10th of 1907, a black man by the name of Leighton Hines was arrested on suspicion of killing Anna Markowitz and Abe Cohen, and it was later alleged by Sheriff Bowes that he had made a full confession. According to one witness, Frank Allen, on the night of the murders, he had seen Hines standing near the park's little bridge. He was greeted by Leighton and greeted back. Sometime later, he heard four shots, but ignored it and moved on. The following day, when he heard of the tragedy, he quickly identified Hines as a man he'd seen in the Park. Hines' attorney, Cumler, tried to make Alan budge on his, in his identification, but failed. On the day of his trial, he confessed to never having a criminal record and to have been intimidated into falsely confessing the crime. Hines was adamant that the assisting prosecuting attorney, Rolt's hand, had abused him in the interview and that Coroner Schultzer and Sheriff Bowes encouraged him to confess in order to be turned loose, end quote. Disregarding his statements, he was still convicted of the double murder, but was spared the death penalty. When the murders continued on, authorities later admitted that they had doubts about his conviction, and later released him. Now we come to other suspects that were identified in the case. So, during the long and complex investigation for which even the head detective in the Gilman murder was once jailed for contempt of court, a multitude of suspects were arrested and later cleared from the various murders. So first off, we have James Rogers, described as a professional tramp. Rogers was arrested for the Gilman killing, although leads were investigated, nothing was of use, and the New York native was later released. Then we have Mr. Poole's suspect. So, on November 26th of 1906, a man by the name of Mr. Poole arrived in Richmond, Indiana from Dayton, claiming to know the identity of Gilman's killer. He explained while resting at the Phillips house in Dayton, he was approached by the alleged killer who told him the details of the crime. According to his claims, the man's wife was away from home and since he had long loved the girl, he wanted Donna to confront his wife about their affair. Donna went with the man where she met her fate and was later dragged off into the bushes. That man was supposedly later arrested in Cincinnati. The Richmond Palladium investigated Poole's claims but found no that no arrest had been made in the aforementioned city with both city's police departments debunking his story. Then we come to the unnamed black man. So, one short report claimed that a restaurant cook by the name of Thomas Wilson, who was aboard the, pa aboard the passenger train which Donna Gilman used, had seen a black man talk to Gilman and later jump off 20 feet from where she was murdered. The authorities went after the man, but no follow-up report details what happened. Then we come to William Partland. So, a veteran of the Spanish-American War, Partland was the then latest in a series of arrests concerning the Gilman murder. He had bruises on his face and had both eyes blackened and was seen near the crime scene. Although he refused to discuss how he acquired these injuries, he claimed to have an alibi and was, li and was likely released soon after. Then we come to Markowitz siblings. So, shortly following the double murder of Anna Markowitz and Abe Cohen, two of her brothers and her younger sister were detained on suspicion, Harry, Jacob, and Bertha. According to authorities, they disapproved of the young couple's relationship and wanted to get rid of both. Sheriff Bowes even claimed that a canvas finger stall found near the crime scene matched the imprint of Harry's thumb, which was coincidentally injured. A pair of handkerchiefs were also located near the crime scene. On August 8th, the day of Anna's burial, however, the Markowitz siblings were all released and attended the funeral in which the local rabbi cursed the ground on which the young girl was murdered. Then we come to Charles Snyder. He was a factory worker and a boarder of the Gippet home. Snyder was one of three persons taken into custody shortly after Mary Forshner's murder. He was first brought up by Barber Leo Kunkel, who accused Snyder of entering into his shop in a panicked state, washing off mud and blood from his clothes before abruptly leaving. According to him, this only occurred half an hour after Forshner's murder. Little credit was given to his statements, and Snyder was proven innocent of the crime shortly thereafter. 
Then we come to Frank Smith, alias J.E. Smith, arrested alongside Cooley and Wilkie. Smith, a black man, was at the time charged with attacking a white girl on January 8th in Dayton's East End. His victim later identified him and authorities suspected him of killing Fullheart solely based on his other crime but had no conclusive proof and later released him along with the others. Then we come to Roy Cooley. He was a molder and close friend of Full Heart, and Cooley was detained by authorities for examination. However, no evidence was found, and he was later released. Then we come to Albert Wilkie, reputed to be Full Heart's fiance. Wilkie was arrested alongside Cooley and Smith. Although detained for a bit longer than the former, he was later released due to lack of evidence as well. Then we come to Elwood Weimer. Uh, he was a black Canadian from Ottawa and Weimer was arrested on January 27th of 1909 in Hamilton on suspicion of murdering Mary Forshner. He confessed to drinking heavily in the past six weeks and this was his reasoning for his nervous behaviour. A day later he was released due to lack of evidence. Then we come to the last suspect in this case, which was Alma Carr. So, on April 25th of 1909, Carr was accused by his former employer, Mary, or Carrie Middlesetter, of being responsible for arsons, pickpockets, and the murder of three women, two in Dayton and one in Boston, New York. One of the two Dayton murders was indeed that of Elizabeth Fullhart, reinforced by the fact that the pair were seen together on January 29th. However, a few days later, Middlesetter made another statement which ironically exonerated Carr, at least concerning Fullhart's killing. Killing. With that, this case remains open, but with many unanswered questions, it still remain unanswered. Please rate the show and let me know what you guys think about this and the many other cases I have covered. You can follow me on all major social media platforms, YouTube, BitChute, Dailymotion. I'm also on Twitter and Instagram. Links are all down below in the description. If you have a case you'd like me to have a look at or cover, don't hesitate to send me a message. I'm your host, and this has been the Unanswered Questions Podcast. Until next time next on Unanswered Question. The content of the book was criticised by fellow Bravo 2-0 Patrol member Malcolm McGowan, who stated, and I quote, Incidents such as teeth extraction and burning with a heated spoon did not happen. It is inconceivable that any such incidents could have occurred without them being discussed or being physically obvious. End quote.